you can find your way back to your seats. As you know, next Sunday is Easter, and we'll be having a special Good Friday service. Friday night, we'll be joining with the congregation that meets with that meets here on Sunday afternoons. And again, we did this last year, and they were jo- going to be joining together for a special service Friday night at seven o'clock. Uh, come, it will be a a great time to be together. And then, of course, next Sunday is Easter. Now, next Sunday is the easiest time to get someone to come to church with you because everybody's looking for a place to go. So if you've got family or friends, this is the time to invite them and say, come to church with me. And I ask you and encourage you to do that. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 22. So far this year, we've been doing a series entitled The Journeys of Abraham. And now we're coming to the final journey that we're going to be covering in this series. It is, in many ways, the most important and most critical journey that Abraham makes. It is the journey to sacrifice that God has given to him. And the theme that I want you to think of in terms of this message is that God is able to do above all we ask or think. God is able to do. God is able to provide. Now, when we look at this particular story, certain things I want you to keep in mind. And that is, this is without a doubt the most difficult, the most problematic journey that Abraham makes. It is a journey of faith. And a lot of times we need to understand that when we are called upon to make that journey of faith, it is for the edification and the education of other people. Abraham is challenged here. But his challenge is reflected in our lives because God is teaching some very powerful lessons. We're going to begin in verse 9 of chapter 22. And it says, Then they came to the place of which God had told him, And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For I, now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This story that we started last week, Abraham has traveled. He has taken two servants with him. He has taken his son, Isaac. God has asked him to do a hard thing. Most of us would think of it as an impossible thing. God has commanded him to offer his son as a sacrifice. Abraham has figured out in his mind the only way that this can happen because he's dealing with a promise that God had given him that Only through Abraham or only through Isaac 
was the seed of Abraham to be given to the world, and through that seed, all the world would be blessed. And so Abraham in his mind has figured, if I kill Isaac, then it's up to God to raise him from the dead, because that is the promise of God. Now we get to the time of sacrifice. Abraham has left his two servants. He has traveled up the mountain. He's taken Isaac with him. On the way up the mountain, Isaac notices we have wood here because Abraham had prepared it before they ever left home. They have the instrument for making fire. They have the knife for the sacrifice. And so Isaac asks in a very innocent way, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Not knowing, the correct answer is, look in the mirror. There's the sacrifice. And Abraham's response is just simply, God will provide. That's the message that he gives his son. God will provide. Now, in Abraham's mind, he thinks God's going to provide because he's called me to kill you, and then I have to trust God to raise you from the dead. And so Abraham has a message to his son, God will provide. But he has an even more powerful message to God, and that is, obedience I am here to obey you as we talked about last week that is the essence of faith faith is primarily our obeying God and our walk faith is not about seeing how much stuff we can believe God for and God doing the things that we want him to do for us Faith is about God speaking to us and our response being a response of obedience. We obey God, not because it's what we want, but we obey God because that is the necessity of following God. We see this throughout the New Testament. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, then come and follow me. If you want to be my disciple, if you want to be sincere about following God, then he would say, then you need to take up your cross and come and follow me. He would say in the Gospel of John, if you love me, keep my commandments. You cannot get away from this idea that there is God and he gives us things to do. He gives us commands to obey and it, our response, the response of faith, is always one of obedience. We obey God. We obey God for many reasons. We obey God because we love Him. We obey God because we've learned over the course of our life that is always the best thing to do. Even when we think it's not the best thing, that is the best thing. When in doubt, obey God. When you're sure of yourself, obey God. When you think you know all that there is, obey God. Because obedience to God is one of those non-negotiable aspects of faith. We believe God, and because we believe Him, we obey Him. That's what Abraham is doing here is he's traveling up the mountain and he's doing everything and he's getting everything ready. And I can see them as they're putting the wood there and gathering it there so that it'll be easy to catch and it will burn the sacrifice. And then there comes that terrible moment when he binds the hands of Isaac. And Isaac realizes, what is going on? 
Isaac here is dealing with something he's never experienced. Oh, yes, there were plenty of other religions in the world that have offered human sacrifice. Some of them did it by the hundreds and the thousands. But never with the one true God. This is something that God has never asked before. And he would never ask again of anybody else. And again, this is sort of the first lesson, if you would look and see here, that God has given us this first hint here that there's something necessary about this event, that he's teaching us all something here, that he's teaching humanity the necessity that one day there would be the need for such a sacrifice. Abraham doesn't realize all that because Abraham is just dealing with the here and the now, just like we do. We just have to deal with, okay, what's here in front of me? And so he's tying his son up and he's laying him on the altar and it's sort of like he's getting the knife out and it's like Isaac's eyes are probably wide open thinking, has dad gone crazy? Is he, what's going on here? Dad thinks he's heard from God. I haven't heard from God. And then at that moment, before the knife strikes, there's another voice. And the message of God. And the first thing is, do not lay your hand on the lad. You talk about relief, you don't know who's more relieved. Isaac laying there tied up or Abraham with a knife in his hands. They're both relieved. Isaac is thinking, I get to live. Abraham is also thinking, I get to live. Because he's been asked to do a terrible thing. And so he's there. And he's listening to the voice. And the voice says, do not lay your hand on the lad. And then the voice says, you fear God. You fear God. We're raised up in a society and a time where everybody says, oh, it's a terrible th th thing to be afraid we don't want you to be afraid. Fear is important. It's an important aspect of life. I want you to just think about that for a moment. As much as we don't like to be afraid, as much as we don't want as protective parents, we don't want our children to be afraid. There are certain things in life you need to be afraid of. You really need to have a certain amount of fear of heights. Because if you're falling off from a high enough place, it will hurt. You need to be afraid of electricity. The first time you receive an electrical shock, Maybe a cord has been cut and you grab it in the wrong place and all of a sudden there's that nice feeling buzz that goes through and you feel like, oh, I think my eyes are lighting up right now. It's good to have a fear of electricity. It's good to have fear of moving objects. You don't want to be sitting there on the train tracks when a train is coming. It's good to have that fear. The most important fear that you can ever develop in your life is the fear of God. 
Proverbs would talk about it like this. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, is the beginning of knowledge. What does he mean by that? It means it's an understanding that the right way to live life is to understand that, number one, there is a God, and number two, that we need to be fearful of him. Not fearful in the sense of terrified, but fearful in the sense of there is great, huge, tremendous power here. You need to be careful. You need to pay attention. You need to be aware that this is not a game. That this is not something that you play with. Fear is important. On many occasions, it will help keep you alive. Now, God doesn't give us that fear of being in terror. But that God gives us that fear, and some people refer to it as awe. And so it's said here to Abraham, you fear God. What does that mean? It means you fear God more than you fear yourself and what other people think about you, what that translates into is, I want to pay attention to God. I want to listen to what he has to say. I want him to be first in my life. It's not by accident that the first of all the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. Our God is a jealous God. He will not live in second place. He will be first or nothing. So he tells Abraham, you fear God. Why does he fear him? Because he sees Abraham's obedience. Abraham turns around after he's heard the command, do not hurt the lad. And there caught in the bushes is the ram. The ram is two things. It is, first of all, a substitute for Isaac. That Isaac is glad to hear and see. And says, whew. And so God is providing, as Abraham promised. God is providing. But more than a substitute for Isaac, the ram is a symbol of Jesus. It's showing us that there is something important going on here. It's showing us that there is a lesson to be learned here, not just for Abraham and his travels and journey, but there's a lesson here that God is trying to teach all of us. And so the symbol of Jesus, where the ram comes in. You see... God stopped... Abraham, not because Abraham, he didn't want Abraham to go through this terrible experience as much as he stopped Abraham because Isaac was not worthy. Isaac was tainted, like all of us. He was tainted because all of us who are the children of Adam and Eve are tainted with this thing that's called sin. We are born in sin. We are contaminated, if you would, by sin. It is a part of our lives. It is a part of our inheritance. Isaac is not worthy to be offered because his blood would do nothing. That's why when you look in all these other religions that sacrifice people and all of that. 
that blood doesn't accomplish anything because the sacrifice is not good enough. Isaac is not good enough. Isaac is not worthy. Isaac's blood will do no good. What this is setting us up for then is that story that we're going to be starting to celebrate this week. As we look at this coming week, the most holy week in the history of the Christian church, when we look at the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, and that brings us to the lesson that we learn, and that is that sacrifice of human blood is needed. The problem is not just anybody will do. God said in the law that without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so they did it for years and years and years, generation upon generation, that it would sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and other different kind of animals. But it was never good enough. In Hebrews, it tells us in that book, it tells us how that these had to be repeated every day in the temple. When they had a temple in Jerusalem and they would go there and they would offer sacrifice, they would have to do it every day. Because yesterday's wasn't good enough. And today's would not be sufficient. It would just barely get us through until tomorrow. And we'd have to do it all over again. Because the sacrifice wasn't good enough. He needed a sacrifice of human blood. But it also needed to be a perfect sacrifice. God had taught them this over and over in their offering, in their animal offerings. He said, you can't take an animal if you were a farmer and you had a bunch of animals there. You couldn't take the sickliest one among them. You couldn't take one that had been born to form. Those weren't good enough. He kept telling them over and over, no, this sacrifice needs to be as close to perfection as it possibly can. And that's true of the human sacrifice that was required too. It needed to be of blood that was untainted by sin. That's why when we go back to Christmas and Easter, those two important events in the year. That's why Jesus was born. He was born and he became a human being, not so that he could understand all the things about being a human is, but so that he could offer himself as a sacrifice. When confronted with this in the Gospel of John, he would say, no man takes my life. I lay it down willingly. So no, not only is he the sacrifice, but he does it willingly. You see, Isaac didn't do this willingly. He didn't say, well, Dad, I'll be glad to die here. Jesus does it willingly. That's why he fulfills both the role as high priest and as sacrifice. He is the one offering the sacrifice, and he is the sacrifice. He has two roles. And so Jesus is coming and Jesus will offer himself and he will die and he will shed his blood and his blood will cover our sins. See, the blood of Isaac wouldn't have covered anybody's sin. The blood of Isaac wouldn't have even covered his own sins. But the blood of Jesus will cover everybody's sins. So God is teaching us a tremendous lesson here. Abraham begins to understand it as he's offered the sacrifice and the fire is burning and the animal is being consumed and the smoke is going up. And he's looking at his son and no doubt there's a smile on his face. And he says, son, we're going to name this place. And we're going to remember this event. 
And the name of this place is God will provide. And that's the story of salvation. God will provide. We need a sacrifice, and we're not good enough. None of us are good enough. God will provide. We need a way of hope, and we're not good enough. We don't have a way. God will provide. This lesson that comes thundering down through the centuries to us over and over again, God will provide. It's been the whole life of Abraham. Abraham, God had said, you know, I'm going to show you a land. You don't live there now, but I'm going to show you, and it's, God will provide. He told Abraham, you're going to have children, and Abraham looks, and I'm getting older, and Sarah's getting older, and we have no children. Till it comes to that point where humanly it's impossible to have children, and yet God will provide. You see, that's a microcosm of what salvation is. We are unable to save ourselves. God will provide. We are unable to do anything for us. God will provide. The message of the gospel, God will provide. The story after the cross, God has provided us a way. Because he loved us. And he gave his only son. The difference between the scene on this mountain and then what would happen hundreds of years later when Jesus was, according to tradition, be offered on the exact same mountain. Here, God stops Abraham and says no. But on that fateful day when Jesus is offered as a sacrifice. There is no one to say no. Nothing illustrates that more than one of the last cries that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. When he cries out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? There's no one to say no on that day. Because that sacrifice was needed. And so as we enter into this week and we reflect about what all that Jesus has done for us. When we reflect on what God has provided for us. Do not neglect so great salvation that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. And that's why in all the other religions of the world where they have practiced human sacrifice and they've had to do it over and over again, in Christianity there was only one offered because there was only one that was possible. And when that one was offered, none other was needed. Because God truly has so loved us that he has given his son for us. And we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given to us. God, I just pray here today, if there's someone here who does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would realize that you have given us your great love and that you have provided for us. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand, please.
If you have a special need this morning and you'd like prayer, we'd like to give you this opportunity to come. There'll be people here to pray for you. Please come during this song. Our first question this morning is Palm Sunday, it looks like. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Do we celebrate Palm Sunday because it is the beginning of the resurrection story? Yes, uh, we celebrate it for a number of reasons. The kids had palm branches here this morning. Uh, that symbolizes the triumphal entry of Jer uh, into Jerusalem the last week of Jesus' life here on earth. They gathered palm branches and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Uh, part of that was because it was prophesied. Part of it was to show the popularity of Jesus and make the powers that be even more scared of the possibility of Jesus messing things up. And so it would begin the events that led to ultimately the death and resurrection of Christ. That is true. All right. Why would God ask someone to kill if one of the commandments is do not kill? Again, killing is tremendous, powerful prohibition throughout the law. Uh, and the first of the human commandments that were disobeyed when uh, Abel is killed by his brother Cain and God confronted him with it. The reason that Abraham is given this lesson is that it's a lesson to all of us that there is the necessity of a human sacrifice that is going to be called upon. So he's being used here as an object lesson to teach us something very, very important. Okay. How do I discern God's commandment from what people insist God absolutely wants, Sabbath, alcohol, women's roles, etc.? Well, there's a number of different ways as you learn more about God's will, then you find that some things are periodical, such as uh, a great example of this is the difference in the law. There is what's called the ceremonial law in the Bible where uh, you follow certain conditions, you wear certain clothes, you avoid eating certain meats. I had someone tell me yesterday, thank God we're Gentiles because of all the bacon and sausage that was there that was prohibited by the law. Uh, and we don't follow that any longer. Why? Because Jesus came and changed that. However, there was a moral law, such as do not kill, do not steal. That has never changed. That has always been in force. It will always be in force. And so the more that you learn about God, the more you learn about there are things that are transitory. They may be in force for a while, but then they change. And then there are things that are permanent. And I could spend a whole hour talking about that. So that's a summary statement, if you will. Okay? Why did the Jewish faith stop sacrificing animals if they don't believe the Messiah has come yet? It's not because they stopped sacrificing animals because the Romans destroyed their temple. They would do it. They don't have a place to do it. And they can't do it just anywhere. And that's why if you've been here on Wednesday nights, why a lot of people who believe in the prophecies of God believe that there will be a temple rebuilt at some point in the future uh, because they want to rebuild their temple. They can't do it now. It would be, as many people would say, politically impossible. But if that temple is going to be built in order to fulfill God's word, guess what? God will provide. <laughs> as he always does. Okay? Is that... Oh. Is God a cannibal? Why does God need human blood or animals incapable of sin? Uh, no, God is not a cannibal. 
Um, God needs human blood because, as it says in the law, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Sin has to be covered. God gave us the first indication of that, if you remember in the story of the Garden of Eden, when um, Adam and Eve are found naked and God clothes them. Now, what's interesting is that God chose innocent animals to clothe them with. I would have at least provided a snakeskin belt. But he doesn't slay the serpent. He chooses innocent animals because he's teaching even at that early lesson. The innocent will die for the sins of humanity. So, anyway, remember the stuff that's going to be happening this week. Uh, God bless you, Brother Dan. Praise God. Hasn't this been a great series coming to an end today? Hallelujah. What a blessing and what a great reminder, even the way it was cleverly tied into the Easter season. Thank you, Pastor. Let's stand together as we conclude the service.